each of you can um, explain in a super simple way your favorite um, apologetics argument for you know just the average normal person that doesn't know much about apologetics how um, someone like that could explain it to you know one of their friends or their family members yeah so um my favorite, okay, so in the realm of apologetics, my favorite argument to talk about is the Kalam cosmological argument, but that's not the one that I would give for the setting that you've just described, because you just said, what if I'm talking to family and friends that don't know that much about apologetics, and so I'm wanting to give them one thing that's going to get them Christianity, okay, because, because the Kalam cosmological argument would get you God's existence, maybe, but not, not Jesus, not Christianity, so I would give them a resurrection case. And I think that for casual conversations, um, I think for casual conversations like this, where I, I, I don't have time to maybe lay out all the reasons why, now we've done that on this channel, on our channel, um, but, the, the what, but I think the simplest thing would be to do is to say, well, look, you know, there, there are actually certain facts about the life of Jesus that though they're mentioned in the Bible, uh, the vast majority of historians and New Testament scholars, whether they're Christian or non-Christian or whatever, all affirm. And here are the ones that I like. Uh, the first one doesn't get mentioned a lot, but I think it's really important. Universally, scholars believe, and there's always a couple of outliers that don't affirm this, but universally, scholars believe that Jesus thought of himself and spoke about himself as though he was God's special agent to bring about the kingdom of God. Okay, that's, that's pretty powerful. Historians and New Testament scholars agree about that. That's pretty big. So it's like Jesus was walking around during his life saying, just watch my life and see what happens. You know, something special is going to happen with my life. Just watch. And, um, and, and then secondly, Jesus died by Roman crucifixion. We, uh, part, that's affirmed in a lot of ways. One thing is the greatest historian of ancient Rome, Cornelius Tacitus, um, mentions this. Um, Bart Ehrman uh, thinks that that is good reason to believe that this is the case. Um, John Dominic Crossan, who is a very liberal um, theologian, says that. So you, you've got these kind of things. Jesus died by Roman crucifixion under Pontius Pilate. So he said, watch my life, see what happens, basically. Um, he died by Roman crucifixion. And afterwards, his followers had experiences that at least they interpreted to be appearances of the risen Christ after his death. And then they were so convinced of this that they were willing to face serious persecution. And all the scholars, atheist, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, they all agree with that fact. Right. So well, not Muslim, but right. So so that so what does some Muslim scholars? So if you take someone so you might get some pushback and say, Well, yeah, but but hold on, Braxton. Um, we don't know for sure that these disciples were willing to die for this claim. But you know what? Sean McDowell. Um, did his dissertation on this issue, and he was very fair with it, but using the um, criteria of, of historical investigation, he concluded that I think three of them pro really had a high degree of certainty did, and that all of them were probably willing to face persecution and perhaps death for this claim. So what you have is, without even opening the Bible to show a friend this, I could say, look, this is what the, the, te the people who are teaching historiography at the schools, the New Testament scholars across the religious spectrum, they affirm that Jesus existed. He thought of himself as God's special agent to bring about the kingdom. He died. His disciples had experiences that they claimed and believed were the risen Christ, and then they were willing to face serious persecution for that. So the best explanation for these facts is that Jesus rose from the dead. And then what we do next is, if anyone wanted to challenge that, we'd, we'd listen and we'd say, okay, does your other explanation, whatever that is, make as much sense as the explanation that Jesus rose from the dead? And I would go to that because even though, and I love talking about the resurrection, I like talking about the philosophical stuff. It's, it's just more fun for me. But to get right to the heart of Christianity, I just think you got to go to the resurrection. Yep. And I just did a... So save your time there. That's my favorite too. And he said exactly what I would say. But I would follow that, Susan, with this. I would say this. I don't hear a lot of people talk about this, but you know, most people aren't atheists. Most people believe in the supernatural and some sort of theism, right? So I, here's something that I think is pretty powerful. 
and, and I don't hear people talk about this much. And this isn't like a, a slam dunk philosophical argument. This is more something that is based each step of it on inference to the best explanation. Well, what makes the most sense out of this fact? If you believe that there's a God, if, if you can at least believe that there's a God, then, um, and I think the arguments that we have for God's existence are so great. But if you can, if you can at least believe in God, that intended creatures like us to exist, who can think and have these moral intuitions and all of these kinds of things, then what is the best explanation? That he created us relational beings, but had no intention of communicating in some way with us, or that such a God would want to communicate with us. I think it makes far more sense that he would want to communicate with us in some way. So then what we would do is, the next step would be, let's start looking to see, is there, is there a religion in the world that, that, that seems to match or make the most sense of that. Well, if we look at, if we look at the, the religions in the world, I would maintain that the polytheistic religions don't work because they have these logical contradictions and things. There are three monotheistic religions that, that are, that, that, well, Judaism isn't as big as some others, but, they, but it undergirds Christianity and Islam. So you've got these three monotheistic religions that have impacted the world, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Now, of course, I wouldn't be a Christian apologist worth my salt if I didn't say Judaism doesn't give you the Trinitarian God of the Bible, uh, but it stands behind all of that, right? Um, Islam obviously describes God vastly different enough that I think we can say that's not the same God we're talking about. Right. But what is important and interesting is all three religions, and these, these are the three big monotheistic religions in the world, and they're all pointing to the God of Abraham as the one true God, right? And interestingly, among those three religions that are all, so this is, this is uh, you know, Christianity and Islam alone, just these massive religions in our world today, pointing to the God of Abraham. And of the Abrahamic religions, you've got one of those religions that has a man who his followers said was the incarnate God, God incarnate, and never wrote anything down so far as we know, but his impact changed the world such that for sure Western civilization is built on the back of Christian Judeo principles, and he, has, he is the centerpiece of human history. So simply put, if you can at least believe there's a God and he made relational human beings and you begin to look around, it, he would have wanted to communicate with us. Where did he likely do that? You stumble across these three monotheistic religions, all pointing, at least in name, to the God of Abraham. And among those, there's one man who is the centerpiece of all human history. I think that's a pretty darn good little case you go. that you could share with someone in a living room somewhere. Yeah, um, that was really good. Mm -hmm.